Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. Stories for Dark and Stormy Nights, Volume 1, Story 1. From a young girl, I was told to never talk to strangers, and through my childhood, I never did. However, in adult life, things change. There is more reason to talk with people you don't know, especially when lonely. When I became a truck driver, the long and empty roads got the better of me, and I'd start giving lifts to hitchhikers who were going to the same place I was. It was the perfect solution for my loneliness, and often I would become friends with the people I gave lifts to. My job was absolutely perfect until that one November night. I had dropped off my cargo at the designated warehouse and was on my way back to the depot. It was going to be a long drive through the night. A few hours into the drive, I saw a man at the side of the road with a black bag and a plaque reading the exact same place I was going. Usually past a certain time, I would ignore it and continue my journey. But something about this man made me feel like I owed it to him and I could do with some company on the journey anyway. I pulled over, opened my window and asked him where he was going, even though I had already read the sign. He just pointed at his plaque and looked up at me. Something about him made me uneasy, but it was too late now, and I told him to hop in. This was a huge mistake. The man climbed in and sat in the passenger seat. He was dressed completely in black, with a silver chain spilling out of the top pocket of his overcoat. At first, I was hesitant. Then I got myself together and shook his hand. It was cold very cold. Not the kind of cold when it has been chilly outside, but the kind when someone has a fever. A wet, clammy, unnatural cold. I looked at his face. He looked like he was in his late fifties with a gray beard and harsh eyes that put you in your place. I cleared my throat and introduced myself. He sent back a rough mumble that didn't sound like a name. All I said was, pleased to meet you, and got back onto the road. I decided it was best not to try and talk too much to the man, unless he talked first. He didn't look like the kind of guy that you'd want to say the wrong thing to. In a couple of minutes, I began to notice how he constantly mummaged inside the bag. It was making a rather unnerving clinking sound of metal hitting other metal. After around an hour of driving, the man had not stopped rummaging inside the bag. I had also noticed that he'd been staring at me for some time, which was creeping me out massively. It really made my skin crawl. On most occasions, if I have a passenger who is not particularly communicative, I would put the radio on, but mine had stopped working last week, and I still needed to get it fixed. In an effort to stop him from staring at me, I asked him, What's in the bag? I immediately regretted it. He looked right at me and said in a raspy voice, Mind your own business. I was slightly shocked by this and tried to pass it off as a bit of a sarcastic joke, although I knew for sure it wasn't. Throughout the journey, the rummaging got louder and louder, and he stared, making strange noises in extremely low tone. I was so unsettled. I began thinking of what to do. I could not go another three hours with this man in my truck. He was now clanging whatever went his bag very hard. He then stopped and started scraping what sounded like a knife against something else. I'd had enough and pulled onto the side of the road. I didn't want to confront this guy, but I asked him once more, what's in the bag? Once again, he responded with, mind your own business. I nodded and said that we had a puncture on the back tire and asked him if he'd mind checking it out while I got the repair kit. He looked at me with a look of complete hatred, then got out of the truck and went round the back. 
I put my foot on the gas and drove. I saw him in my taillight stare after me with what looked like a smile spread across his face. His hands looked like they were covered in blood. I still see that image every time I close my eyes. I made it back to the depot, trying desperately to forget the man. Then I realized he had left his bag. Obviously, I could not help but look in it, but I wish I hadn't. The bag was full of different metal objects, all of them looking like some kind of torture device. From knives and shackles to ropes and bars, I then realized they were all covered in blood. I don't know why I didn't turn the bag into the police, but I thought that because it had my fingerprints on it, it would not end well for me. I took the bag home and did some more searching through it, and to my horror, at the bottom of the bag was a picture of my truck, a picture of the registration, and a picture of me holding the bag. I could hardly sleep, but in the end I managed to get a few hours. I definitely couldn't go to the police now. It looked like the bag belonged to me, but I decided that I had to. I put the bag in a box and was about to walk out of the door when I noticed something. The picture of me holding the bag was nailed into the door with a note attached. All it read was, Mind your own business. Story number two. I've been a truck driver for some time now, and I've experienced many things on the road. Some have stayed with me for years, while some will probably stay with me forever. One of these experiences will for sure stay with me until the day I die. I have been placed on a very long journey, taking a load 10 hours cross country. There was nothing but dreadful music on the radio and I was beginning to get tired. It had got dark some time ago and was now extremely late. I decided to call in for the night at the next motel I came across. I didn't even care if it was a bad one. I now really wish I had. I pulled up and looked around. The place looked awful. The paint was peeling off the walls. The windows were dirty and there was multiple letters missing from the sign. The strangest part was that there were no cars in the parking lot. On any other occasion, I'd have taken that was a strong warning to stay away. But I'd been driving all day and did not have the energy to get back in the truck and drive somewhere else. I went over to the reception and there was no one there. I rang the bell and still no one came. I waited a few more minutes, repeatedly ringing the bell. Annoyed, I turned around and began to walk away, but then I heard a voice. I looked round to see an elderly man with very few teeth grinning at me wildly. He welcomed me to the motel and asked if he could be of assistance. I told him that I needed a room for the night and that I'd like a room with a view of my truck. I always ask this at most motels. It just makes me feel more secure for some reason. He fumbled round for a bit and then threw me a key with a room number on it. I paid him up front because I'd be setting off early in the morning. As I was walking up the stairs, I heard him say in a muffled tone, you have a great night's sleep. He then chuckled to himself quietly. This should have creeped me out, but I was far too exhausted to care. The first thing I noticed when I entered my room was that it was not facing my truck, like I'd asked, instead just the dumpsters on the other side of the building. The bed was comfy and the room was big, but I couldn't help but feel that something wasn't right. There were stains on the carpet, dark stains. The walls were covered in marks, and there was something a plastic bin bag in the bath. I couldn't tell what it was, but it was big. I lifted the top to see in, and I was almost sick. Inside was the head of a pig, not nicely severed like a butcher would do, but a deep, rough cut. This was absolutely disgusting, but as the walls were crawling with cockroaches anyway, I decided it best not to use the shower or the bath and drew the curtain across. I tried to forget about what I had seen. I woke not to the sound of my alarm clock, 
with the sound of voices outside my room. It was two in the morning. Who would be out of bed at this time? I just assumed it was another guest and tried to get back to sleep, but before I could, I heard the unmistakable sound of a key in the lock. I flew out of the bed and onto the bathroom and immediately hid in the tub, trying to ignore the pig's head that lay next to me. The curtain was drawn across, but I could see a small amount through a moth-eaten hole in the curtain. I heard the door swing open and the sound of footsteps as someone entered the room. I peeked through the hole to see a man wearing a ski mask walk over to my bed. He had something in his hand. The man threw off the covers and cursed. I then heard the voice of the man from the reception whisper, What's wrong? The man in the ski mask responded, He's not here. He must have left earlier than we thought he would. I then saw the man start leaving, and a huge amount of relief washed over me. Then he stopped, turned around and walked straight to the bathroom. It felt like my heart had stopped beating. I tried to flatten myself into the bottom of the tub, although I knew it wouldn't do much good. He stood there for a good few minutes. I then heard the man cough, spit something into the sink, and leave. When I was sure they were gone, I got out, grabbed my bag, and left. I used the emergency exit at the side of the building. I ran round to my truck and got in, started the engine, and drove. As I was leaving, I saw someone in the window staring at me, grinning his nasty, toothless grin. I didn't look back and got out of there. I'd driven nearly 20 miles when I was pulled over by highway patrolman. He asked me if I was aware my back doors were hanging open. I told him no and went to check it out. A large amount of my load had been stolen and many other boxes had been slashed open. I told the patrolman everything about the motel and what happened to me. He shook his head in disbelief and told me something that made me gasp. That motel 20 miles up road, the owner died there four years ago, and it's been abandoned ever since. Story number three. Being a trucker means constant travel. Constant travel means constant change, and constant change means constant danger. This was something I had to accept when I took the job all those years ago. But back then, I thought that nothing would ever happen to me. There was no chance of me running into danger. I was completely invincible behind the wheel of my rig. But hell, was I wrong. I'd crossed the state border a while ago and my eyes were starting to get heavy. I hadn't seen anyone else on the road for miles and I was getting bored of listening to chat shows after chat show. Suddenly, the truck started slowing down. I put my foot down harder on the pedal, but it had no effect. I shook myself wide awake and sat up. My truck rolled a few more meters, then came to a halt. I just sat there for a minute, confused, before I unclipped my belt and climbed out. I quickly came to the realization that I had run out of fuel. I was pretty pissed at myself for not paying more attention, and thinking about it, I did hear the warning bleat some time ago was about to call my boss when I heard a voice from behind me. I spun around real fast, holding my phone as if it were a weapon. The man slowly approached me, looking to be in his early forties with graying hair and a mustache. He seemed to be chewing a lump of tobacco and walking with a slight limp. Looks like you've run out of gas, he croaked. Still approaching me, I shrugged and told him that I'd be fine and started to walk back towards the truck. I got a place not so far from here where I could get you some fuel. I didn't believe him. Too many things didn't add up. Why was he out here at this location, at this time, just as I broke down? I said that I already had come in the back and I didn't need any help. I got in and locked the doors. I just wanted this man to go away. I saw him walk off into the tree line and disappear. I called my boss and he said he'd sent someone out to tell me, but they might take some time. I ended up falling asleep where I sat. 
feeling much more secure with my doors locked and the man gone. I woke up sometime later and realized that I was moving. I was confused at first, but then remembered that someone had been sent to tow the truck. I wondered why they didn't wake me up, but maybe they tried. I'm a deep sleeper and the doors were locked. I noticed it was still dark outside and tried to work out where we were going on the map. I couldn't see any signs along the sides of the road and had no clue where I was. I opened the window and shouted to the tower, where are we going? Why hadn't he just taken me to the garage? After a while, we appeared to be on a very rural road, almost like we were driving through a forest. In the distance, there was a large barn, and we seemed to be heading towards it. I couldn't get the attention of the tower, so I called my boss to see what was going on. He sounded extremely puzzled and said the tower wasn't due to arrive at my location for another hour. I was losing it and shouted at my boss. Then who the hell is towing me? My boss called the police and told me to try and get out of the vehicle. I didn't need telling twice. Swung open the door and jumped out. I was winded and lay there for a moment. The tow truck then stopped. The tower must have heard the sound of the door. I got up immediately and ran. I had no clue where I was and chose a random direction. Looking over my shoulder, I saw him and immediately recognized the face. It was the man from earlier. He spat a mound of tobacco out of his mouth and jumped out of the truck. I ran faster and faster, but then I heard the noise of a gunshot ring out. I hit the floor and crawled behind the nearest tree, terrified. The man was walking fast now and shouting for me to come out. He didn't see exactly where I went, but he probably had a good idea. I managed to drag myself behind the log, breathing as quietly as I could. The man was getting closer, calling, turn yourself in and it'll be quick. I couldn't move anymore now. He would hear me. The man stopped right next to my log, looked around, and ran off in another direction. I breathed a sigh of relief and looked out. The man was about a hundred meters away and looking right at me. I bolted for the truck and made it underneath the sound of bullets slamming against the metal. I had nowhere to run and he was here. Just as I thought it was all over, I heard a sound of sirens. The man swore and ran off into the woods. I climbed out from under the truck and met the officers that had arrived. Two of them had already run off after the man. They asked me what happened and took me back to the station for questioning. I answered all of their questions and told them about the barn I was being towed to. It was inspected and sealed off. When asked what they found, I was told that it was best I didn't know. I can only imagine what would have happened to me if I'd stayed in the truck. However, I do know one thing. That man is still on the loose, and I can only pity the poor soul who runs into him next. Story number four. As a trucker, I travel a lot, traveling to places I wish I hadn't been. As a trucker, I see a lot, seeing some things I wish I'd never seen. As a trucker, I experienced a lot, experiencing things I'd wish I'd never experienced. But it is these things that make me who I am, and that is why I love the job, not knowing what I'll run into next. However, unknowing means you cannot foreplan how you will act in certain situations, and I do not make the right choices in certain situations at all. I was in the UK a while back, taking a load up to the north of England. It was dark with few stars in the sky. I couldn't quite focus on the road for some reason and kept fiddling with the radio. A few minutes past of me doing this, I looked up and saw something right in the path of my headlights. Sprawled out on the ground was a body. It wasn't moving. I pulled the truck into the side and climbed out. 
I approached the body slowly, cautiously asked, Are you okay, sir? No reply. I walked over, about to take his pulse. I then realized there was no need. Blood was oozing out from underneath him. An obvious stab wound. It was clear to see the man was dead, and I knew that I had to call the police. I dialed the emergency number and explained to them what I'd found, and they said they would send someone out to me and to stay put. A few moments later, I heard a voice shouting and the sound of footsteps, fast footsteps, hitting the floor hard. I could make out the silhouette of two men, one carrying a bag. I knew exactly what that was for. I sprinted back to my truck and clambered in, heart pounding. How could this be happening to me? That was the question thumping inside my head. The men had made it to the body now. One man chucking the bag and then running for his car. I hadn't seen them parked on the other side of the road. The second man ran over to my truck and started trying to climb up. I opened the door powerfully on his face. He cried out in agony and fell backwards. I did the only thing I could think to do, drive. I slammed my foot on the accelerator and got out of there as quickly as I could, relieved that I had got away in time. The relief didn't last long as I noticed headlights behind me. I was being chased down and of course, he was much faster than me. The car behind me was gradually gaining. I knew I could not run him, but I sure could outsize him. I waited until he was on the right of my tail and then crushed the brake. I was flung forward into my seat. By the time I had recovered, he was gone. I did not know where or how I hadn't hit him. I saw a turning a few yards to the left and could only assume he had taken that. I put my foot down and once again, I wanted to make sure that the other man did not catch up. I had been speeding along for a good five minutes when I noticed something in the middle of the road ahead. It was two cars, two cars that I recognized. It was the men. They had formed some kind of roadblock. A thousand thoughts were spinning around in my head. Had I really stumbled across something that serious, that these people needed me dead? Why didn't they attempt just to get away? What could I do now? Earlier, I talked about how in a certain situation, I made the wrong choices. Now was one of those times. I plowed straight through the block and didn't stop. The cops arrived at the scene and questioned me on what happened and how two cars ended up lying wrecked in the middle of the road. I told them what I'd done. One man had been hospitalized and the other had escaped on foot. Detectives found fresh tire marks nearby and deduced that the man had gotten away by car. It turned out the men were gang leaders. The two of them had killed the man I found on the side of the road, who was also identified as a leader of a gang. I still curse myself that the other man got away. For some reason, I can never shake that feeling that somehow I will see him again. Next story. The mind is a delicate vessel. Feed it too much and it collapses. Feed it too little and it dissolves. But if you keep feeding the mind the same thing over and over, it becomes routine and nothing out of the ordinary. Or so they say. Over the course of my trucking career, I've seen all manners of terrifying things. More than any one person should be subjected to. And it is these things that have made my mind collapse. I hear a noise at night. It doesn't feel like an ordinary occurrence. Instead, it petrifies me. All the terrible things that I've experienced come rushing back to me. And all it would take is a snap of a twig behind me in the forest. My experiences have made me paranoid. But it is this very paranoia that saved my life. I've been driving for what seemed like days, endlessly moving forward along the roads, road after road. My eyes fixated on the ground in front of me. I was starving. I needed a break and my Radiohead playlist was coming to an end. I pulled up at a gasoline station and filled up the rig. I paid and moved it to a parking lot to the other side of the station. The parking lot was nearly deserted, but a few cars 
were scattered around here and there. I didn't like the feel of the place. Something about it made me shiver. I shrugged it off and went into the station for a coffee and a bite to eat. I returned to my truck an hour or so later got in. I'd driven a good few miles when I heard a tapping. I slowed my truck down and observed the road around me. There were no other cars. Where did that noise come from? I carried on driving and after a while I heard it again, even louder this time. What was going on? By now I was incredibly confused, but continued driving nevertheless. After 20 minutes I heard repeated tapping. This time I knew exactly where it came from. It was from inside the truck. If I wasn't so paranoid all the time, I would have passed it off as something in the mechanics making the sound. But I knew I couldn't just assume that. I stopped it at the side of the road and got out. I walked around to the back. The first thing I noticed was that the clamp had been busted off and the doors had been tampered with. I was puzzled and opened them up. Inside, everything was as it should be. No one inside. No boxes moved. It all looked to be okay. I reattached the clamp and got back in. I knew something human had broken the lock. Maybe they broke it, but couldn't figure out how to get the doors open. While this was unsettling, at least I knew nothing was in there. I drove back off into the night. I drove for hours more when eventually I suddenly felt a great unease. Something was in the back. I knew it. I stopped the truck, got my gun out of the glove box, and marched round. I undid the clamp and flung open the doors. My gun raised. Inside again, I saw nothing. I couldn't believe it. I knew something was in there. I lowered my gun and was ready to walk away when I saw something move. Someone was climbing out from behind some boxes and standing up. The dark figure stood at the other end of the truck. I shot at him and missed. I shot again and again without hitting whoever it was. The thing started walking towards me, fast. It had nearly reached me and I pulled the trigger. My gun clicked empty. I threw it into the ground and hurled the doors shut, feeling pressure up against them on the other side. I managed to clip the bolt and immediately called the police. They were with me quickly and I explained the situation. One officer opened the doors while the other one covered him. Both of them entered the truck and began to look behind the boxes. A few minutes later, they got out and told me that they didn't find anyone, but they did find one thing, a carving of a body with a slit throat that had been etched into one of the boxes at the back, and the knife was still stuck in it. It was tested for fingerprints, but none were found. A few weeks later, I was driving along when I heard tapping once again. I couldn't bring myself to look in the back. I just told myself it was in my mind. It was my mind playing tricks. I pray to God that I am right. Next story. Something happened to me, something awful. I can hardly close my eyes anymore without worrying. Something from my past will come back to get me. What happened to me in my most recent haul has darkened my past even more. While my mind tries to repress these things, it also tries to convince me that they are not over and whoever has troubled me is coming back. I was taking my cargo through the mountains, no service on my phone, no reception on the radio, just the sound of nothing. It'd been like this for miles, just me, my truck, and the road ahead. It was very refreshing, exactly what I needed after the trauma of my past years. I noticed the time and sped up. I wanted to be out of the mountains before dark, but at this rate, it wasn't looking likely. Some time went on and I was busting for a piss. I pulled up and got out. I was finishing up when I noticed something in the not so far distant. This was the first time I saw it, a creature resembling a man, a large man. I was about to call out when I realized that something was wrong with his face. I slowly came to the realization that this wasn't a man at all. 
The shocking thing was, it wasn't any animal I'd seen before either. It stared straight at me. The silence was interrupted by the cracking of twigs as this thing charged straight at me. I sprinted back to the van, got in. I immediately shoved the keys into the ignition. My peaceful trance had been snapped. I slammed down the accelerator, something I had to do way too much these last few days. As I began to roll off, I saw the thing burst from the line and onto the road behind me. I was picking up speed, but so was the creature. I looked in my rear view mirror and saw the thing standing in the road staring after me with a snarl on its face. It was not really truly a face. The thing must have been a seriously disformed man. It had a human body, but the stance of a wolf on its hind legs. Its face much too big for a person. The eyes were not aligned and the mouth had retreated too far up its face. I shook my head and drove on. Another thing for my mind to repress and another thing to make my therapist tell me I was crazy. I had covered a lot of ground and had almost made it out of the mountain range. Dusk had fallen hard onto the horizon and I had almost forgotten about what I'd seen. My radio began to crackle, meaning I was picking up reception and it looked like my phone had a bar of signal. I was relieved and in the first time in ages, I smiled. The smile was ripped from my face when I looked out of my window. Upon a high rock up the side was the clear silhouette of the man. Its head turned and fixed on my truck. My heart sank down into my gut and continued its descent as I saw the thing jump off the rock and charge down the hillside towards me. How the hell had it made it this far? There was no possible way for the man to have gotten there on foot. My confusion ceased when I noticed how close it was to me. I sped up, building speed way too slowly. The man was close now, almost able to grab onto the side of the rig. I noticed a corner up ahead and the wing mirror, I saw him about to jump over the back. I turned the corner very sharply. The thing had missed its opportunity and bounded off into the hills. I drove on for many miles. The darkness has settled now. I realized that my radio had stopped crackling and my phone still had no signal. I was sure I would be out of the mountains by now. I stopped, looked at my map and immediately knew I had taken the wrong turn. I'd followed the signpost, I'd taken the sign that pointed to Main Road. I thought back and recalled that the sign had been pretty wonky and been tipped upside down. I realized how much of a fool I'd been. Obviously, it was the wrong road, as the sign was the right way up would have pointed the other way. In all my fear, I hadn't batted an eyelid. Looking at my map, there was nowhere to turn around for miles. With a heavy sigh, I drove on, but then once I could have sworn I saw something in the trees. Along the road, I kept noticing something walking behind the tree line, but I saw it only once every couple of miles. I didn't even want to think about what it was. After what seemed like the longest drive of my life, I reached the turning point and began to swing the truck round. Once I was facing the right direction, I let out a whimper. It was standing in the road in front of me. I got a better look at him this time. It was a man. He was tall and very wide. His face, like I noticed earlier, was extremely deformed. He began to walk towards me very fast. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't wait there and I couldn't reverse. I locked my door and drove forward, hoping to scare him off. For a brief moment, I thought I did. He began to walk around towards the side. I then heard him climbing up the passenger side. I grabbed the keys from my pocket and locked the doors. In the same second, I heard the heart-wrenching tug on the handle. A split second later, and that thing would have been inside. I swore, and I drove on. The man was pounding on the window now, extremely hard. Thud, thud, thud. 
This was the single most horrifying moment of my life. I don't know what I was thinking, but I wound down the window a small amount. The man instantly stuck his fingers through. I then wound the window up quickly. He screamed and pulled him out, falling onto the roadside. I carried on driving, not looking back once. I made it onto the main road, turned the radio up full, and almost cried when I saw other cars. My phone had signal, and I called my boss, telling him what happened. He didn't believe me, of course, and told me to take the next few days off, and that he'd book me an appointment with a therapist in the morning. I felt so safe back on the busy road, and was the happiest I'd ever been in a long time, which was to be driving in traffic. I lay in my bed that night, running things over my head. As I looked out of my window, I was almost sure I could see something watching me. Surprisingly, I went straight to sleep and didn't wake up for 16 hours. I would never be driving a mountain route again.